Can we start with a prayer? Would you lead us in a prayer? I guess we just said Vespers. Okay. <laughs> Saint Innocent. Help me talk about you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Contemporary Confessors, part three. I believe two weeks ago we heard about St. Raphael, last week St. John Maximovich. Um, and now continuing our theme of American saints, we're going to talk about St. Innocent of Alaska. Before we get to St. Innocent, though, uh, I'd like to kind of give some of the context for Russian Alaska, Rus Orthodoxy in Alaska, um, how it got started. You know, I don't know how many of you know this or don't, but Alaska is, you know, is the state, the U.S. state with the oldest Orthodox presence. Um, so it was originally discovered by Russian fur traders in 1648. They kept it a secret to avoid taxes from the government, which I found amusing. Um, in the early 18th cent century, uh, a Danish man, Vitus Bering, who, after whom the Bering Strait is named, uh, was commissioned to explore this region and see if the rumors about Alaska were true. These expeditions mapped the northwestern coast of North America, uh, they, and the crew who went, it wasn't only scientific, but they went and they collected 1,500 sea otter pelts, which they sold for nearly 1,000 rubles each to Chinese traders. Uh, I, looked at, I tried to convert the currency to figure out how much 1,000 rubles in the early 1700s was to today, but I couldn't figure it out. It sounds like a lot, because um, this set off a fur rush. There was a stampede of fur traders going from Russia to Alaska, resulting in 100 expeditions over the next 50 years, uh, seeking their fortunes, so about 1750 to 1800, thereabout. Each expedition, expedition lasted for at least a whole year, and one in five did not even survive the journey. These are like the frontiersmen we know about in America, uh, you know, who rushed west during the gold rush. Um, they frequently kept their discoveries of new islands or new peoples secret to avoid taxes from the government so they could trade without paying taxes. And some of these men never left. Uh, they even stayed, they took native wives, uh, they had families and, and they baptized their children. They did lay baptisms on their children and this will be important later on. Um, the unregulated, unregulated period of fur rush came to an end in 1798 when the Tsar incorporated the Russian American Company. This is a state-sponsored company, kind of like the du Dutch East Indies Company and things like that. Uh, the government supported, this is a government-supported monopoly over all fur trading in Alaska. One, the man who convinced the Tsar to do this was a fur trader named Gregory Shelikov, who was a very uh, ambitious type. He came from Alaska all the way back to St. Petersburg telling exaggerated stories about the numbers of natives on Kodiak uh, and about how many of them he had baptized, how he built a church for them and a school for them and all the kids were in this school and you know maybe we can take some of the bright ones here to Russia and educate them here. He really made himself out to be a generous type of guy. He begged for a priest to be assigned there for the chapel um, that he allegedly built on Kodiak that would be built at the company's expense. The Metropolitan of Moscow uh, believed Shelikov so much that he didn't send one priest, but a team of 10 missionary monks. A few of them were priests. The head of this mission was Father Joasaf, and one of the monks was uh, Herman, who would later be going to be St. Herman of Alaska, you may have heard of. They all came from the famous Valam Monastery in, on the border, with, on the, near the modern day border with Finland. After a year-long journey across half the known world, um, this, this is uh, where the, how far their journey took them, if you can even see this, Valam Monastery over here to Kodiak over here. So half the world away. Uh, they, re they found a very different story than what was described by Shelikov. Uh, and they quickly realized that their goals were the opposite goals of the company men. The village was nothing like the picturesque community, des community described. There was certainly no church. Native hunters were forced at gunpoint to search for sea otters in treacherous seas. Women were violated, children abused. The infamous manager of the company, Alexander Baranov, with a wife back in Siber Siberia, kept a native mistress and encouraged his men to do the same. 
So an immediate clash took place between Baranov and the monks over the lies that were told and Baranov's treatments of the natives. The monk's leader, Father Joasaf, wrote a scathing letter to Shalikov back in St. Petersburg, sadly believing him to be a good man who would rectify the problems. This was not the case. Father Joasaf finally was called back to Irkuk, Irkutsk, is how I guess I might pronounce it, in Siberia to provide personal testimony against the company. Before he left, he appointed the monk Herman in charge of the mission and instructed him to continue operating the school. Father Joseph's goal was to found a seminary on Alaskan soil, on American soil. In St. Petersburg, they said, oh, send us the smartest natives. We'll train them in the seminary and we'll send them back. He said, no, he was the first person to say, we have to train natives here on their own soil, in their own language. He was an incredibly visionary man. So upon his um, arrival in Siberia, the synod ordained Father Joasaf as Bishop of Kodiak. This would give him the authority necessary to enact some serious reforms on the colony. He would have the political and, and spiritual authority. Uh, however, his ship did not make the journey. Neither he nor the clergymen traveling with him survived. Meanwhile, the monks at Kodiak continued teaching baptizing and defending the native, natives from the fur traders of the Russian American company. Because the monk, monks defended the natives, they were, li they were listened to warmly, and the entire native population of the Kodiak region accepted baptism during the first two years of the mission, a total of nearly 7,000 converts. The monks studied the native religion. They found its similarities to Christianity they recognized the commonality between the two accounts, the university, universality of God in the heart of man, stating God is not a name, but an idea, deep-seated in the nature of human beings, something which cannot be explained, as Justin the philosopher, St. Justin Martyr, wrote. So they're employing an ancient missionary practice. St. Justin Martyr was probably the first person to state this idea in the second century that the, the seed of knowledge of God is within the heart of all men. Divine wisdom is in the heart of all men and you can extract what is true from the heart of all cultures. Every culture has a seedling of the truth and so that's what these monks did. They went to Alaska, they found that seedling of truth and they pulled it out, they nurtured that. They connected Christianity with the, um, with the native faith. Just a word about St. Herman, briefly. Um, this is Three Saints Bay, by the way, in Co on Kodiak Island. This was the original headquarters for the Russian American Company. St. Herman, um, after the departure of Father Joasaf, uh, largely the group of 10 men started to fall apart. Many of them were martyred. They died in shipwreck or the, uh, Father Juvenali went into deep regions of Alaska and was killed by the natives there. A, a brief word about Father Juvenali. He was on a kayak in the lake preaching to the natives and their shaman on land told them to shoot him with arrows. And the account that comes down from the natives was that while they were shooting him, he was making a weird motion with his hands as if he was waving the arrows away. And later Russian uh, hearers of this story realized that he was blessing them with the sign of the cross while they were shooting arrows at him. This is St. Juvenali. Um, back to St. Herman. He moved to the tiny Spruce Island where he lived in a little hut for 40 years. He lived as the desert ascetics of old in Egypt lived, but in Alaska. He taught the children. He healed people with water from his spring. He performed feats of incredible strength. He was seen carrying huge logs that would have taken multiple men to carry. He had a huge wicker basket with which he carried um, his produce and things like that, that it was reported you know, no man could hold it by himself, but he would carry it by himself somehow. And he emaciated his body with fasting. He was thin as bones. Um, it, but it wasn't until after his death that they found 16 pound chains he wore around his body constantly under his clothes. 
Saint Hermit is one of these, you know, heavenly men and earthly angels that we sing about. He was a constant defender of the natives, such that he is still known by them as Father Herman today, or Appa Herman. Um, this is a recurring theme. Many later critics uh, will look at um, the history of Russian Alaska and say, oh look, the, the monks were in league with the Russian government to subdue and put their thumb on the natives, when the reality is the opposite. The monks were defending the natives. They were fighting for their freedom. They loved them as their own children. And all of this is going to be seen in the life of Saint Innocent, who we will now turn to. He was born with the name Ivan, or John, I believe in 1797. Um, he, his father died at a young age when he was only six years old, and so he was raised by his uncle, who was a mechanic and a builder. Um, he went to the local seminary school, got married the daughter of a local priest, was ordained a priest at age 24. When the call went out for a priest to go serve in uh, Unalaska, this is an island, uh, in the Unalaska district in Alaska, no one would respond because the fur traders who came back to his hometown described a wild country inhabited with savages until one day, to the bishop's surprise, uh, Father John, St. Innocent, agreed to go. This puzzled the bishop who didn't want to lose such a promising young priest. Father John admitted that he met a man from Unalaska who described the Aleuts as being kind in nature and being eager to be catechized. The bishop withheld his approval for a while, but seeing Father John's eagerness, he gave his consent. Father John thus began the 14-month journey to Alaska with his aging mother, his brother, his wife, and his infant son. Just to give you a scope of how far they traveled, here is Irkutsk, which is St. Innocent's hometown, and here's Unalaska on the Aleutian chain. 14 months with an infant. Just let that sink in. <laughs> He found the natives to be kind, but very ignorant of Christian teachings. This is about 30 years into the Christian presence the, the pre since the arrival of the original 10 monks. He spent his first year preparing the material to build a church and a house. Um, and the reason he had to build a house is because there was no house for him to move into. He moved his family into a native style bara bara a semi-subterranean hut. Must I repeat that he had an infant son? <laughs> um, he taught the natives carpentry, blacksmithing, bricklaying, and masonry, at the same time strenuously applying himself to study their language, beliefs, customs, traditions. This man was a, a jack of all trades. He could work with his hands and with his mind. He quickly learned their language, familiarized himself with their character, their mental state, their abilities. Only at this point, after he came to learn the people, to learn their language, did he begin to apply the Christian teachings to his people. Did he begin to teach them? He didn't change them too radically or too suddenly. And that's where his wonderful talent as a teacher and, and missionary shows itself. So finally, after about a year, they had the material to build a church. Most of the work was done with his own hands. He was Christianizing the people at the same time, using their native mythologies to teach biblical truths. Excuse me. He began to travel to many nearby islands, learning their language and customs and preaching to them. Here's a painting of him on a dog sled. Well, I suppose those are reindeer. Um, he also traveled, I couldn't find a painting or picture of this, but he is famous for traveling hundreds of miles in, on the treacherous Alaskan seas in a kayak by himself. He's an unbelievable man. Um, he began, he traveled to the nearby islands. He learned many of the native languages and dialects. Um, and around this time, he began his monumental work of translating the Gospel of St. Matthew into Aleut. He later translated part of the Gospel of St. Luke and wrote a book, a short little book called Indication of the Way into the Kingdom of Heaven. You can still find this today if you look it up online, The Way into the Kingdom of Heaven by St. Innocent of Alaska. It's a marvelous work. He devised a unique alphabet 
for the Aleut language and created grammar books and primers to teach the natives to read and write their own language. You can see him taking his cues from St. Cyril and Methodius, who 900 years earlier enlightened the Slavs and created an alphabet for the Slavic peoples and then wrote the Bible in this alphabet that they created so that they could preach to the people and give them Bibles. So this is a, a, a common motif in Christian missions, in Orthodox missions, is not just giving them the gospel, but giving them the tools to understand and appreciate and comprehend the gospel, giving them literacy, teaching them, you know, blacksmithing, like St. Innocent did, teaching them skills for life. Um, if I may, I, I'd like to read one story about a native man that St. Innocent met. This book, Orthodox Alaska, and then this one, Alaskan Mission Spirituality, are kind of the two authoritative works on Orthodox Alaska. These are from our library here, so you can check them out. They're both by Father Michael Alexa, who's a very well-known, well-respected priest in Alaska. Um, so if I may, I'd like to read this story uh, from St. Innocent's Journal. It takes place in November 1829. It's a report he wrote to his bishop about his remarkable encounter with a native shaman. In 1828, I made a bedarka journey, like a kayak journey, to the island of Akun for the purpose of ministering to the natives there. On coming close to the beach, all the people of the village, dressed in their best clothes, were gathered on the shore, evidently for my reception. On getting out of my bedarka, I asked the meaning of this. They answered that they knew I was coming and came out to greet me and welcomed me to their island. I asked why they were so dressed up, and they said, we knew that you had left on Alaska for this island and would be here today, and to show our joy, we came here to welcome you. And who told you I would be here today, and how did you recognize me as Father Venyaminov? Our shaman, old man Smirenikov, told us that you had started from Unalaska and would be here today, that you will teach us about God and how to pray to him. Later, I met old man Smirenikov. He was about 60 years of age. He was believed to be a shaman. The reason for this was that this man performed unexplicable, unexplainable manifestations. One of the most striking was this. One woman stepped on a clips trap, a wooden trap powered by twisted rawhide, which catches its victim by a single tong pressing against the flat board, thereby severely injuring her knee. The barbs on the lever of the trap, about two inches long, struck her kneecap, causing a very painful and dangerous wound. Blood poisoning had set in, and the woman was at death's door. In fact, there did not seem to be any hope for her recovery. The relatives of the woman appealed to Smirenikov for help. He came to see the woman, and after looking at her for a short time, he said, she will be well in the morning. To everyone's surprise, the next morning, this woman arose from her sickbed perfectly well, with no indication of the wound or soreness in her knee. Another striking incident was his help in procuring food for the whole village. During the winter of 1825, the natives of Akun village were entirely without food. Some of the more venturesome asked old man Smirenikov to give the people of Akun a whale so that they would not die of starvation. He said, I will ask for it. Shortly afterwards, he came with the information that if they would go to a certain beach on the island, they would find the whale they had asked for. All went to the designated spot and found the whale on the beach. Excuse me. This instance of his wonderful prophetic power was borne out by his knowledge of my movements at a great distance so great that he could not possibly have known about me unless he possessed occult powers. So St. Innocent is hearing these miraculous stories about this man and thinking, wow, he must be communicating with some powerful demon, this shaman, right? Similar narratives confirmed by many reputable witnesses induced me to interrogate old man Smirenikov. My desire was to know how he could know certain events ahead of time and by what means he cured sickness. Thanking me for posing these questions, he told me the following. Shortly after I was baptized by Father Makari, who was one of the original 10 monks, first one, then two men appeared to me. They were not visible to others, but I could see them and talk to them, and they spoke to me. They had white faces and were dressed in clothing similar to the paintings in the church, representing the Archangel Gabriel. 
These spirits told the old man that they were sent by God to teach the people and to guard them from harm. During the course of 30 years, these spirits appeared to him almost daily. They instructed him in the tenets of the Christian religion and the mysteries of faith. It is unnecessary here to repeat all that he said on the subject, for what he said were really the teachings of Christ. These spirits rendered him and through him to other people on the island help in sickness, distress, and trouble. In this connection, the spirits always said that they would ask God if he were willing to help. The help would be received. Once in so often, he would acquaint the people with events taking place in other remote regions. In this, the spirits invariably said that what they told him was not of their own power, but came from God. I asked him, how do they teach you to pray? Do they want you to bow, bow yourself down to them and pray to them? Smirnikov answered, they teach me to pray to God alone, to pray in spirit and with a pure heart. They often prayed with me for long periods. I gave him the following instructions. I can plainly see that the spirits who visit you are good spirits, and you must follow their teachings. To those who ask you for help, you must say that they must ask God themselves. God is our Father, and he will help those who put their trust in him. I do not forbid you to render help to those who are ill, but in helping them, you must explain that it is not you who gives this help, but God by his mighty power. Father John then asked if he could meet these spirits and Smirnikov said he would have to ask them. The next day he came to Father John and told him that the spirits, the spirits were willing to see him and let him see them. Reconsidering, Venyaminov concluded that he only wanted to see them out of curiosity, and if he did see them, it might make him proud of this distinction. He decided instead to report the matter to his bishop and ask for his advice, producing the account reproduced here. A year later, he received an affirmative response from his bishop but when Father John returned to Akun, he learned that Smirenikov had died. Forgive me for relating so, so long a story, but I find it to be so inspiring and, and shocking almost to hear about this. You know, these 10 monks were sent to these hundreds of islands in Alaska, kayaking from island to island, teaching people and baptizing those who were willing, but then they had to keep going. They had to leave the sheep without a shepherd. But God provided a shepherd. He provided his angels to come and through this one man, help the people, save the people, heal them of their sicknesses, feel them, feed them, uh, doing you know, Christ's work, the things that Christ did. And it also outlines the, the amazing humility of St. Innocent that he, he wanted to meet these spirits and then once he, the spirits would have allowed him to meet them, he realized that it was out of his pride and he would make himself arrogant by the distinction and so he decided not to. He, he decided out of obedience to go to his bishop and then a year later he went back with the approval and the man had died and so he decided, you know, in a sense perhaps God, it wasn't God's will for him to meet these spirits. So back to the life of Saint Innocent. Not only is he a priest, but he was an incredible scientist and educator. He was brilliant. He compiled, like I mentioned, a grammar of the Aleutian language. He studied the climate of the region, the population, and the products of the Unalaska re area. He studied the fur seal. This was the main product of the fur traders and gave the Russian American company his suggestions for more sensible and scientific modes for harvesting the animals. His suggestions saved the fur seal population from extermination and saved the company thousands of rubles. He was a biological researcher while he's converting the people. He built a good wooden house, built all of the furniture in it. Um, about his furniture, uh, Father Chad Hatfield, the president of St. Vladimir Seminary, where I just graduated, he was, before that, he was the dean of St. Herman's Seminary on Kodiak Island, and he said St. Innocent's desk is still perfectly straight, is like built like it's solid. You know, he's, he's a really impressive carpenter. He built his own wall clock, he made a functioning clock. He spent his evenings in mechanical pursuits, making clocks, hand organs, and musical instruments. And he made all the candles for his own churches. The list goes on and on. I mean, I, am, I, I don't have words to describe this incredible man. He taught in the boys' school and compiled the school books for use throughout schools in Alaska. He established a boarding school for secondary level education, like high school. But looking at its curriculum, we would consider this to be college level work. 
mathematics, history, medicine, Latin, Russian grammar, native languages, rhetoric, geography, penmanship, logic, physics, astronomy, navigational science, and biblical studies. He got the Russian American company to finance this boarding school, but all of the staff were Orthodox clergy and volunteers, most of whom were Creole. You know, Creole meaning one Russian parent, one Russian father, one native mother. In 1838, Father John traveled to St. Petersburg. I'll show you another picture. This is a great picture painting of him giving communion to the natives. He traveled to St. Petersburg to petition for permission and funds to publish his translations of liturgical works and scripture in the native languages. While he was there, he received word that his wife had died. He requested permission to return to his hometown, but he was instead encouraged to take monastic tonsure. He put it off for a little while and then eventually received it in November of 1840. Less than a month later, he was ordained Bishop of Kamchatka and the Kuril Islands, which included the Aleutian chain of islands where he had been ministering. He spent the next nine years administering his diocese out of New Archangel, known today as Sitka, as seen here, um, and taking remote missionary journeys. In 1842, he opened a seminary at New Archangel, fulfilling 